All right, hello everybody, I'm Josh Redstone, and welcome to my YouTube channel, where I am attempting to bring my philosophy class, Philosophy 2501A, online in light of the COVID-19 situation. Uh, as I said in my previous video lecture, I hope all my students are doing well, I hope you're all hanging in there, and I appreciate you bearing with me while I try to bring this course online for you. So. Um, with that said, let's get started. All right, so today's lecture deals with the first part of chapter 10 of our course textbook, Consciousness, an Introduction by Susan Blackmore. And this chapter is all about the neural correlates of consciousness. It's somewhat of a dense chapter, which is why I've decided to break it up into two lectures. Um, but in any case, Blackmore begins by posing an interesting question to get us started. She asks, and I'm paraphrasing here, if you could look inside of the brain and see everything that was going on, everything that was happening in there, would you then understand consciousness? If you think the answer to that question is yes, then you're probably one of those people who would be interested in identifying what we call neural correlates of consciousness. That is, um, areas of the brain, patterns of activity, uh, so on and so forth, that correspond to subjective conscious experience. In other words, um, objective observable things in the human brain that correspond to our subjective phenomenal conscious experiences. Um, of course, thinkers throughout the years have been skeptical about whether um, the neural correlates of consciousness will actually help us explain conscious experience. And I think this is nicely illustrated by something that's come to be known as Leibniz's Mill. It's, a, it's an idea that was first written down by Gottfried Leibniz in the early uh, 18th century. And he wrote, and I quote, in imagining that there is a machine whose construction would enable it to think, to sense, and to have perception, one could conceive it enlarged while retaining the same proportions, so that one could enter into it just like a windmill. Supposing this, one should, when visiting within it, find only parts pushing one another, and never anything by which to explain a perception. Thus, it is in the simple substance, and not in the composite or in the machine, that one must look for perception. So what's Leibniz saying here? Well. An idea that was uh, quite fashionable at the time was the idea that the human body, including the human brain, worked a lot like a very sophisticated machine. And what Leibniz is saying here is that if you could blow this machine up, or for our purposes, if you could blow the brain up and walk around inside of it, you would only observe physical processes going on. You wouldn't observe anything that would be able to um, tell you anything about consciousness or rather you wouldn't observe consciousness within that physical system. So Leibniz famously argued um, for um, an explanation of consciousness that turns on his idea of monads, um, these little unextended bits of substance that he thinks make everything up. Uh, we're not going to talk about that in very much detail. Um, nonetheless, um, as, I, as I mentioned, we could we could change this so that we're not talking about a machine like a mill, but rather a human brain, like Blackmore is talking about. And we could ask, if we could look inside of that brain, if we could get inside of it, walk around in it, or even just examine this brain in much greater spatial and temporal resolution than we're currently able to, would we be able to identify uh, consciousness itself? or something um, that at least corresponds to consciousness or explains consciousness. And of course your answer to this question is going to depend on where you sit theoretically. So as Blackmore points out, identity theorists and eliminative materialists would probably disagree with Leibniz and they would not agree that um, Leibniz's mill is a very good um, a very good analogy for what's going on in the human brain. Um, for those who uh, perhaps don't remember or who aren't familiar, identity theorists um, 
think of brain states, uh, think of mental states as identical to brain states. So to have the mental state of um, being in pain or a phenomenal state of being in pain is just to have a corresponding brain state. And eliminative materialists um, say that a lot of these, um, a lot of theoretical terms such as beliefs, desires, propositional attitudes, qualia, those kinds of things are not useful, then that we should kind of get rid of those and just focus on brain states. So identity theory and eliminative materialism are closely related in that way. And each uh, kind of theorist would disagree with Leibniz. Um, they would say that all there is to our conscious experience is what is going on in the brain. So they would be very excited about walking around in Leibniz's mill or um, a gigantic brain that we've blown up to some, you know, some very great size that we could walk around in and examine. Uh, they would agree that we could find and identify uh, these neural correlates of consciousness. Of course, Mysterians would uh, disagree. Mysteri by Mysterians, I'm, I'm talking to people, I'm talking about people like substance dualists or um, people who are adherents of panpsychism. Um, where uh, however they explain consciousness is not amenable to objective scientific study. Um, so they would disagree uh, with the eliminative materialists and identity theorists and agree with Leibniz. Um, we cannot understand consciousness by studying the brain. Perhaps consciousness is something that we cannot understand scientifically because of its subjectivity. That's another answer. Or that's another response that some, some of these theorists might offer. And of course, um, extended minders, as Blackmore calls them, would also disagree uh, with the identity theorists and eliminative materialists, but they would disagree for the different reasons than Mysterians would. We haven't really talked very much about the extended mind uh, hypothesis in this course, although if um, if time permits, which I'm sure it will, given the current situation, um, I may make a video about the extended mind. In any case, extended minders believe that the mind or cognition does not just happen in the head. Cognition um, and other things like consciousness are rather extended um, beyond the bounds of the skull in, into the organism's body and into the world. Um, the one example that I think we've talked about in detail in this class so far um, was the theory of inactive perception. So that's Alvin Noe and Kevin O'Regan's theory of inactive perception, where perception is something we do. So perceptions aren't something we have, they're something that depend on certain sensory motor contingencies that we have. That's why they say perception is something that we do. So they would... Um, they would, uh, they would say, no, we, we could not understand everything there is to understand about consciousness by blowing up the human brain and walking around inside of it or looking at it with tools that are um, far better than those that we currently have. But they would say that not because consciousness depends on some kind of um, mysterious, um, you know, mysterious other substance that we can't study uh, scientifically, they would rather say that uh, looking for consciousness in the brain is um, to commit the mirological, or excuse me, the myriological fallacy. Uh, in other words, attributing a function to a part of something that is really a function of, of a whole. In this case, the whole is the brain, the body, and the world, not just the brain. Um, that's what extended minders would think. Now, whatever your theoretical leanings here, um, you probably think that the brain is important in some way or another for consciousness. Even people who we might uh, place within that substance dualist or Mysterian category, um, like Benjamin Liebe with his conscious mental field, would still agree that brains are important in some sense for conscious experience. But when we study brain scientifically, of course, all we see is the physical stuff. The neurons, the connections between them, i.e. the synapses, 
neurotransmitters, neuromodulators, all of that stuff. Um, we can't identify consciousness, we can't observe consciousness by using uh, neuroscientific tools, by uh, staining uh, slices of brain tissue, um, and this is the problem that I think Leibniz was trying to highlight, or at least a similar problem, a version of this problem um, that thinkers were faced with at, at the time uh, that they were working in the 18th century. Uh, essentially, we're still dancing around the hard problem of consciousness, or the mind-body problem. Um, nonetheless, Regardless of where you sit, you probably think that brains are important for consciousness in some way or another. So, it would probably be a good idea to take a sort of whistle-stop tour of the human brain. So that's what we're going to do now. To put it simply, the human brain is one of the most complicated things uh, that you can find in nature. The human brain contains about 100 billion neurons and trillions of connections between those neurons. Those connections, by the way, we call synapses. And of course, we also have neurons that run throughout the body, sensory neurons and motor neurons, basically neurons for feeling and for doing things, for carrying out actions. All of these neurons throughout the body connect to the spinal cord, which itself is connected to the brain stem at the base of the brain. Together, the brain and the spinal cord make up what we call the central nervous system, and everything else makes up what we call the peripheral nervous system. The spinal cord connects to the brain at the brain stem, which itself consists of the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain. So the brain stem does a number of important things. It helps to control cardiac functions, respiratory functions, sexual functions, and it helps regulate our sleep-wake cycle as well. It contains important nuclei, uh, such as the superior colliculus, which sends visual information to the lateral geniculate nucleus in the thalamus. That's a mouthful. Uh, it also contains the inferior colliculus, which is important for carrying auditory information. Um, it contains the substantia nigra, which is implicated in Parkinson's disease. And we've also got the reticular formation, um, which plays a role in pain desensitization and forms part of what neuroscientists call the reticular activating system. An interesting thing about the brainstem uh, is that animals with no cortex, if they're um, born with some kind of congenital um, uh, brain disorder where the cortex is underdeveloped or absent, um, but intact brainstems, still possess um, sleep-wake cycles. So the brainstem might be a necessary component for consciousness if we're talking neural correlates of consciousness, but it's not sufficient for consciousness. In other words, uh, the brainstem might play a role in terms of its regulation of our sleep-wake cycle. Uh, when we're awake, we're conscious. Obviously when we're asleep, we are unconscious. Um, but it's not sufficient. It's not everything that we need, although it is arguably a necessary part of however consciousness is realized in the brain. Situated behind the midbrain is the cerebellum, or little brain, and the main function of the cerebellum is motor control. Between the midbrain and the cortex is an area of the brain called the thalamus. The thalamus uh, will turn out to be pretty important when it comes to our discussion of the neural correlates of consciousness. So what does the thalamus do? Well, the thalamus contains many, many relays 
we could call them relays, um, for different kinds of sensory inputs like vision, audition, touch, olfaction, and even motor functions. Um, these relays pass information along in what neuroscientists call thalamocortical loops, that is loops of activity between the thalamus and the cortex, which we'll discuss in a moment. As we'll see, many thinkers think that these thalamocortical loops have an important role to play in explaining subjective consciousness, and they may in fact turn out to be the neural correlates of consciousness that certain thinkers like Francis Crick or Christoph Koch are uh, seeking to identify. Thalamocortical loops, by the way, are well developed in human beings, although we do find them in other higher mammals. The outermost layer of the human brain is called the cortex, and it contains all these different folds and ridges. This is the part of the brain that probably most people are familiar with. This is the part of the brain that you see the most of when you look at a picture of a brain or a brain in a vat. Before we talk about the cortex, though, I want to talk about a very old part of the brain, the limbic system. So the limbic system is part of the brain that we share with other animals, uh, mammals of course, but also birds and reptiles. In fact, sometimes the limbic system is called the reptilian brain or the quote-unquote lizard brain. I myself have referred to the limbic system as the lizard brain in some of our in-person lectures, as my students will be aware. So what does the limbic system do? Well, the limbic system includes a number of important brain regions, brain structures that have been implicated um, in consciousness. For example, the limbic system contains the hippocampus, which is important for the formation and maintenance of long-term memories. And it's also important in terms of our uh, formation and maintenance of cognitive maps, that is mental maps of our environment. The limbic system also contains the amygdala, which is important um, in terms of the pleasure reward system and in mediating emotions, especially emotions like fear, disgust, anger, rudimentary basic emotions like that. Uh, the limbic system also contains the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus helps to regulate the body's autonomic system. So here we're talking about things like blood pressure, heart rate, sexual arousal, and those kinds of things. The neocortex, or new cortex, has expanded significantly over the course of human evolution. And the neocortex is that large folded area you see on the exterior surface of one's brain uh, when you see it in pictures and so forth. The outside or exterior of the neocortex is composed of gray matter, which gets its name from its appearance when examined under the microscope. Gray matter has a kind of grayish hue to it because of the presence of unmyelinated axons um, that are attached to the neurons, uh, the cell bodies of the neurons in the exterior of the cortex. Uh, myelin is basically a substance that forms a kind of sheath around nerves to protect them. Um, and it's these unmyelinated fibers that give gray matter its grayish appearance. Underneath this layer of gray matter is a layer of white matter, where we have more myelinated axons, thereby giving them a kind of whitish appearance under the microscope. The two main types of neurons that we find in the neocortex are excitatory pyramidal cells and inhibitory interneurons. Now most of the cortex is arranged in six layers. There's one layer on the outside and more layers as you go deeper into the cortex. And there are also vertical columns of neurons within the neurocortex that we call cortical columns that are functionally organized. That is, these groups of cells are organized in terms of the information processing functions that are realized within them. 
Some of our sensory areas are organized in a similar hierarchical manner, where levels of processing uh, kind of build on one another, such that higher level processes build on simpler, more rudimentary information processes, or information processing processes. Huh. Time for more coffee. Now, of course, all of these different areas of the cortex, and indeed throughout the brain, are highly specialized, but no area of the brain is completely isolated from another area of the brain. There are long cortical, or <clears throat> there are these long cortical cortical connections, and also the previously mentioned corticothalamic loops which connect all these different areas of the cortex together and which also connect areas of the cortex to the thalamus. And of course, as we zoom out further, we start to see the large scale uh, structure of the brain. And that is the, the, the division of the brain into two hemispheres, what we call cerebral hemispheres. These are, of course, connected by the larger corpus callosum and the smaller anterior commissure. Now, each of these cerebral hemispheres has four lobes. We have the occipital lobe, which is on the back or posterior end of the brain. The occipital lobe is where the visual cortex is located. We have the parietal lobes, which are important for um, our sensory systems and uh, it's where our somatosensory cortex is located. Uh, there are the temporal lobes, which are, of course, uh, involved in auditory processing, as well as certain memory functions. We also have the frontal lobes, which in humans um, play a very large role in planning behaviors and in executive functions. We can also divide areas of the cortex into smaller areas, smaller than these four lobes on each side if we want to. That's exactly what the 19th century neuroscientist Corbinian Broadman did. And um, of course, you may have heard this term Broadman's areas. Well, those are the areas of the cortex that Corbinian Broadman differentiated between, or differentiated between on the basis of their different cytoarchitecture, or the different uh, sort of cellular structures and types of connections um, that he observed in those different areas. Okay, so now that we have a basic idea of the overall layout of the human brain, um, why don't we try looking inside of it? So we want to find something in the brain that corresponds to conscious experience, but it's not immediately obvious what we should be looking for. Um, are we looking for um, groups of neurons or patterns of activity within those groups? What level of spatial and temporal granularity should we look at? Should we look at single neurons or very small groups of neurons? Should we look at larger neural networks? Should we look at cortical columns? Should we look at cortical lobes? Should we look at the entire brain? Or should we take an approach that the extended minders have and look at the brain and the body and the world? And of course, it's worth uh, cautioning ourselves about um, the problem of attributing uh, causal relations uh, when we observe a correlation. Uh, correlation does not necessarily equal causality, right? If two events are correlated, A and B, there are a number of different possibilities um, that we can use to explain the correlation between those two. One is obviously that A caused B. Another is that B caused A. Yet another is that both A and B were caused by something else, say C, for example. Or perhaps A and B are not causally related at all, but are in fact the same thing. With these cautions in mind, Let's go ahead and take a look at a couple possible ways um, that we might identify these neural correlates of consciousness. We're going to look at two for the rest of this lecture. Um, one is studying 
unconsciousness and what's going on the br in the brain when we're unconscious versus when we're conscious. And the other is by examining conscious vision and trying to identify a neural correlate of a, one particular kind of conscious experience, namely visual experience. All right. So one of the ways that we might identify neural correlates of consciousness is by examining different cases of unconsciousness. And I'm not just talking about the difference between being in a, awake, um, being asleep in non-REM sleep uh, versus REM sleep or something like that. There is actually quite a, quite a spectrum of conscious and unconscious activity that's highlighted by certain cases which Susan Blackmore discusses in this chapter. So one example um, uh, that's very different um, from our, our waking consciousness would be something like a persistent vegetative state. So here we have wakefulness or apparent wakefulness without any kind of conscious awareness. And this lies somewhere between a coma um, where one is completely unconscious and a minimally conscious state. There's also something similar, um, yet quite different, known as locked-in syndrome. Here, um, one's muscles are paralyzed so that it would seem to somebody, um, a doctor or a friend or somebody like that, that one was perhaps in a coma or a persistent vegetative state. But even though one is completely paralyzed, one remains fully conscious in cases of locked-in syndrome. And of course, we can use functional neuroimaging to examine the brains of people uh, who are in a persistent vegetative state or a coma or who are suffering from locked-in syndrome and compare those to scans of people's, I guess, for lack of a better term, normally functioning brains and try to identify neural correlates of consciousness that way. So one example of this kind of work that's mentioned in your textbook is that of neurologist Stephen Lorries, um, who tested a number of different patients using electrical stimulation. Um, he was able to elicit activity in these patients' brainstem, thalamus, and primary sensory motor cortices, but not higher up in their pain matrices. So what's going on here? Well. Stephen Loris is testing people in a persistent, a persistent vegetative state. People who, once again, seem to be awake but don't have any kind of conscious awareness. He's stimulating their skin with an electrode, uh, basically to induce a small electric shock. Nothing too painful, but something that you would notice, something that might cause you to withdraw your hand. Um, like receiving a shock from a, an electric fence or something like that. Um, what he found was that activity was elicited in the brain stem, but not higher up, uh, higher up in terms of higher levels of information processing. And he concluded from this research that the persist, uh, persistent, uh, he concluded from this research that persistent vegetative states are actually a result of a disconnection between primary sensory areas, which are lower down in the information processing hierarchy, and higher uh, centers of information processing, like those we find in frontal areas or parietal areas in the brain. Here, uh, or one of the conclusions that Lorries offers here is that, I quote, neural activity in primary cortices is necessary but not sufficient for awareness. Um, so that is to say that neural activity in these lower level um, information processing centers is necessary, but not sufficient uh, for consciousness. We can also look at cases of anesthesia. Um, for example, we can vary dosages of different kinds of anesthetics and examine what happens in people's brains using functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI imaging. So uh, the anesthetics propofol and isoflurane, for example, 
have been found to cause a global suppression of cortical functioning as the dosage of these drugs increases. So the more of these drugs there are, that are administered, um, the lower the uh, cortical activity we observe in the neocortex on, uh, by using functional neural imaging. However, um, we haven't found any evidence of neural circuitry that is specific to consciousness when we examine what happens to people's brains um, when we administer these kinds of anesthetics. One possibility, however, is that the suppression of consciousness uh, during anesthesia might be caused by a blocking at or slightly above the thalamus. I say above as in in that information processing chain going from lower levels like the thalamus up to higher levels of information processing in the cortex. Um, we might be blocking information from traveling from the thalamus to the cortex or to other important areas. And this might be causing um, the suppression of consciousness in cases of anesthetics. Um, so we don't know if this occurs in the thalamus itself or within the earlier mentioned thalamocortical loops or even with it between uh, some interaction between thalamocortical loops and uh, cortical cortical reverberant loops. Um, but in any case, what seems to be happening here is also what we observe in patients who are in a persistent vegetative state. It's important to note, however, that not all anesthetics work this way. For example, ketamine uh, doesn't work in the same way that isoflurane and propofol work. Um, uh, I, I probably won't say too much more about this in this lecture, but if you have any questions about the difference between ketamine and those other anesthetics, let me know in the comments section. One thing that bears mentioning about this kind of uh, data, this kind of neurological data, is of course that typically sample sizes in these kinds of studies are very small. Um, when we're scanning people's brains, we're almost always dealing with very small sample sizes. So we have to be careful how we interpret the results of studies like this. All right, so, so much for discussion of cases of unconsciousness versus cases of consciousness. I want to move on now to discussing conscious vision and identifying neural correlates of specific kinds of consciousness, namely conscious visual experience. So Francis Crick and Christoph Koch have searched for the neural correlates of visual conscious experience. And they've proposed, broadly speaking, that there are, in the frontal areas of the brain, these kind of unconscious homunculi or zombie information processing pathways that observe sensory areas of the brain. So areas lower down in the information processing chain. Um, and they posit further that there may be many such networks in the brain. And this is broadly the line of thinking that they have pursued, at least that Crick pursued up until his death, and I think that Christoph Koch continues to pursue now um, when it comes to identifying whether there are neural correlates of consciousness and what those correlates might be. So we're talking something like um, possibly, uh, you know, large networks within the brain, not what individual neurons or small groups of neurons are doing, but larger neural networks. So in Susan Blackmore's book, Conversations on Consciousness, which is a series of interviews with all of the big names within consciousness studies, including Crick and Koch, uh, Francis Crick is quoted as saying, uh, when it concerning uh, the neural correlates of consciousness. First, I quote, you want an idea of whether it's that set of cells firing, it's being neural correlates of consciousness, whether it's that set of cells firing, or whether they fire in a special way, or whether it's a combination of the two, or something else quite different. This is uh, Crick kind of 
setting, uh, giving you the the setup for his research project. Um, he's outlining different ways we can think about the neural correlates of consciousness here. So in other words, is it a specific place? Is it a certain group of neurons? Is it a certain kind of pattern of neural activity? Um, and of course, this leads us to certain questions, like if some processing is conscious and some not, what is the magic difference? What is it that makes something conscious versus unconscious? What makes certain things enter into consciousness and others um, fall out of consciousness? Of course, um, some of you uh, are no doubt detecting a whiff of Cartesian materialism here. So for those of you who uh, may just be joining in, or even for my students who could use a bit of a reminder, um, Cartesian materialism is an idea that comes from Daniel Dennett. Um, we've uh, sort of gotten rid of a lot of the... Um, we've gotten rid of a lot of elements of substance dualism, of which Rene Descartes, the philosopher and mathematician, um, was a was a champion of. So in other words, um, most people who study the mind nowadays are materialists. Um, materialism is a kind of substance monism. That is the metaphysical view that only one kind of substance exists. In this case, matter. And you could you could include matter and energy together as a single substance because as Albert Einstein famously showed, mat matter and energy are interchangeable. So most of us are substance monists now. Most of us are, in fact, materialists. Yet we still speak of a special place within the brain where it all comes together, as if there was a sort of theater in the mind, and whatever is going on in that theater is what we're conscious of. Um, of course, um, most people who study consciousness nowadays are materialists, they don't espouse substance dualism, as René Descartes did, but they do still think of consciousness in Cartesian terms. That is to say, they think of, they think of consciousness... Uh, that is to say, they, they're tempted to reason that there's a specific time or place within the brain where things become conscious or enter into consciousness. They enter into a kind of Cartesian theater, if you like. Um, there's a worry about that, at least for thinkers like Daniel Dennett, when it comes to identifying the neural correlates of consciousness. In any case, um, the worry of Cartesian materialism aside, there's still the worry about the hard problem of consciousness. That is, how do subjective conscious states arise out of physical, um, processes going on in the brain. Crick largely ignores this problem, uh, this problem of subjectivity. Um, so Francis Crick suggests that there are these reverberatory circuits between the thalamus and cortical layers 4 and 6 uh, that he takes to be crucial for consciousness. And he's not the only one to suggest that something like this is uh, what's going on. So um, McKay, another neuroscientist, suggests that, I quote, the cooperative to and fro traffic between cortical and deeper levels of neural activity, deeper levels like activity in the thalamus, end quote, um, are important for consciousness. Uh, Cotterill has also suggested that lower level um, lower-level information processing structures in the brain, such as the anterior cingulate, may be a site for consciousness. Of course, there's our worry of Cartesian materialism popping up again. So is the anterior cingulate the site of consciousness? I would say no, and I would say probably in line with thinkers like Dennett that we are mistaken if we think we're going to find a specific place and time within the brain where it all comes together. Granted, this, material, this Cartesian materialism is not as big of a worry for Crick as it is for Cotterill. I mean, Crick isn't proposing that there is one specific place and time in the brain where it all comes together to create a conscious experience. 
He's reporting, it, or what Crick is suggesting it, is that it's the activity of these circuits, um, these, these different cortical, cortical, and thalamocortical loops. It's the activity within all of those very complicated circuits that somehow gives rise to consciousness. Does he explain how, um, does Crick give an account of how this explains subjectivity? and qualia and those kinds of things? No. Um, so for Crick, the hard problem is still the bigger worry. Um, nonetheless, um, the hard problem and Cartesian materialism are both worries to one extent or another for a lot of these thinkers. Anyway, let's continue. So Ramachandran has also made a similar claim, I quote, the circuitry that embodies the vivid subjective quality of consciousness resides mainly in parts of the temporal lobes, such as the amygdala, septum, hypothalamus, and insular cortex, and a single proje projection zone in the frontal lobes, the cingulate gyrus. And that's quoting from uh, Ramachandran and Blakesley. Again, we've got to talk of a projection zone here, as if we're talking about some kind of screen or stage in a mental theater. And we have to be very careful when you applying these analogies to the brain if we want to avoid this worry of Cartesian materialism. If you're one of those thinkers who believes that the idea or the, the, the notion of trying to locate consciousness or at least what kinds of neural structures or patterns of neural activity are correlated with consciousness even if you think that those are, are that, that, that that's a fool's errand um, neuroscientists have nonetheless made some progress in identifying neural correlates of our visual experiences for example we know a lot about how vision works now we know that visual information gets from the retina to the superior colliculus via the optic nerves. Specifically, information from the left side of space um, and uh, travels uh, down the right side and from the right side of space on the left side to the superior colliculus. And from there, some of this visual information travels to our eye movement system, which helps us control how we move our eyes. Some of it also goes to the lateral geniculate nucleus in the thalamus. Now, from there, this information travels to the visual cortex. It travels through an area that we call V1, and then subsequently to areas V2, to areas V5, MT, and other areas um, that have varied uh, types of information processing functions. Now, of course, we know that damage to the eyes damage to the thalamus, or damage to area V1 in our visual cortex, can cause blindness. So we know, once again, that these early processing pathways, or lower level information processing pathways, are necessary for conscious visual experience. But they're not sufficient for conscious visual experience. In other words, to have a visual experience, we need uh, the thalamus. We need areas V1 through V5. Um, we need eyes that function properly. Um, but that's not all that we need. We need more than that to, for us to, to have a visual conscious experience. For example, patients who have activity um, in which in whose brains we can observe activity in area V1, but no connections from V1 to higher areas, areas that are higher up in that information processing pathway, um, don't have conscious visual experiences. Conversely, think about when we're dreaming. We dream during REM sleep, and oftentimes if we wake up from a dream, immediately following a dream, we can still remember our dreams. People often report after waking up from dreams that they've had visual experiences, um, oftentimes vivid visual experiences. But here's the interesting thing. Area V1 
is suppressed during REM sleep. So area V1 is not involved in our visual experience during dreams. Now, whether you think that these uh, visual experiences actually count as conscious visual experiences, that is, experiences when we're dreaming, is another question. Indeed, whether you think dreams count as experiences at all is another question that we'll be exploring in a future online lecture. Um, nonetheless, this example shows that um, we're still not entirely certain what not only the necessary but also the sufficient um, means are to have a conscious visual experience. Other studies, uh, for example, single cell recording uh, studies done on certain monkeys, show that cells in area V1 can't differentiate between movement that's caused by our eye movements and movements that is found in the scene. Cells that are higher up in our visual processing hierarchy can make that distinction. So those cells are likely also necessary in order to have a conscious visual experience. I mean, think about it. If we didn't have information processing centers in the brain that did that, um, we couldn't tell the difference between the motion uh, that's caused by our eyes moving and motion in the environment. Every time we turned our head, it might seem like the world was moving and not our head moving. So this is why thinkers like Christoph Koch conclude that while V1, the area of our visual cortex that we call V1, is necessary for normal seeing, just like eyes are necessary for normal seeing, V1 neurons don't actually contribute to our phenomenal visual experience. All right, so that's it for today. Um, I know that this lecture has been a little bit shorter than usual. Um, it's certainly been a challenge to try to bring this material to you online. And of course, I'd just like to apologize once again to all of my students for the delay. Uh, this has been a very chaotic time for everybody. Um, so thank you all for bearing with me, and I hope you are all doing okay. Um, I really sincerely do. Now for next time, uh, we will complete chapter 10, and I'll have a little bit more to say about what our final lectures will look like. Um, I did post an announcement on CU Learn for my students. You'll all be able to access that, um, wherein I indicated that I, I've had to change things up a little bit for our final couple of lectures. But I've decided to lighten the load in terms of reading. So after we finish Chapter 10, I will be doing a lecture on what we can learn about consciousness from dreams and dreaming. Following that, I think I'll spend our last two lectures talking about artificial minds and artificial consciousness, simply because that's my area, and I feel like I would be able to give you the most bang for your buck if we decided to focus on that topic uh, for our final two lectures. And of course, I'll have more to say about your essay assignment and the final exam shortly. So, once again, um, thank you for hanging in there. Thank you for bearing with me. I hope you're all doing okay. I really do. My best wishes go out to all of you. Um, and if you have any questions about today's material um, or anything else, my students will be able to get a hold of me via email, or you can leave a message in the comments section. Um, and for anyone else who may have chanced upon this video, if you have questions, please leave them in the comments section for me. Thank you, and I'll see you all next time.